62 today. I was only 61 last Saturday. So it sort of made me think a little bit about growing older to celebrate the fact that I am a year older. I decided to share a little bit with you about what I used to look like when I was younger. So I brought a blast from the past today. It's like, wow. And you might find it hard. That, that picture's probably 1983, 1984. It was at a camp at Redwood Glen. And uh, I laughed. I thought it was like really a bad picture. And my wife said, I like that picture. Because to her, that's the guy that she fell in love with and married way back when. But to me, I was like, wow, am I glad that's not me? And I was thinking about this. What's really strange about that picture, that's me. But it's not me, right? I mean, you know, if you had a DNA sample from 1984, you'd find out that really is Jim Kennan. And yet, in many ways, that's not who I am today. And so that's sort of the old self, for which I'm very thankful that there's a new self today. And you guys are laughing, but... I'm going to go behind your back and find pictures of you that I'm going to do that next week from 40 years ago. The fact is, all of us here today have an old self, right? Go back 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, 70, 80, 90 years. Um, we all have an old self that is us and yet isn't who we are today. Today we're going to continue on with our series, This Is Us, from the book of Romans. And in chapter 6 of Romans, the end of chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, Paul talks about the idea that in all of us, there are two people. There's an old self, and there's a new self. And what we're going to see today is that the old self and the new self, there's tension between those two people. There's a constant tension in our life as we follow Jesus between the old self and the new self. Let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, as Paul talks about these two people that lives inside of those who follow Jesus. Verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. If we have been united with Him in a death like His, we will certainly also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died... He died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Amen. Verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him 
as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. A little context here for Romans 6. At the end of Romans 5, Paul raises a theological issue. We've been talking about justification. The truth that in Christ Jesus, God has justified us, has declared us righteous. That God has forgiven us of our sins. And Paul says this happens through faith by grace. So at the end of chapter 5, Paul, evidently, there are some people that Paul needs to address who are taking the concept of grace. How many of you would say grace is a good thing? Yeah, people, that's the only way we're getting to heaven is by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what some people were evidently saying was that if grace is good, and we all agree it is, how many of you would also say that God forgives us of our sins through Christ? by grace. So they were putting two and two together. They were saying grace is good and God forgives us of our sins. What sins does God forgive us? All. All sin. So this is the way the thinking was going. If grace is good and God forgives us of all of our sins, let's sin a lot. Now think about it. It's actually really logical, right? If God forgives you, let's sin. And if we sin, it's proof that God's grace is good. Let's sin a lot. Okay? There were actually people in the early church that taught this. So in Romans chapter 6, Paul begins in verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Should we keep on sinning? And what's Paul's answer? No way! He says, by no means. I think you could almost read that. He says, are you nuts? No! We don't keep on sinning so that God's grace might increase or abound. So, Paul in Romans 6 teaches us that we as followers of Jesus Christ should not sin. What's the problem with that statement? Anybody have a problem with that? I do. All right? Paul says we should, somebody said it over here, everybody sins. But Paul says we should not sin. So I'm going to stop right here because before I take that type of advice from somebody, I need to make sure that they understand where I am in life. I mean, come on, this is the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest human beings to ever walk the face of the earth. Of course, Paul, of course, Paul, you can say don't sin because you're Paul. <laughs> Why should I listen to him? Verse 7, in verse 15, or chapter 7, in verse 15, Paul gives us a wonderful glimpse into his little world when it comes to sin. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It's one of the few that keeps me going. Verse 15 in chapter 7, Paul says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, and I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good if I do not do what I want to do. I agree the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it. It is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For if I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, then I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it. It is sin living in me who does it. 
21 times Paul uses the word do or does. And what he's saying in chapter 7, there are two people living in him. Not that he's schizophrenic, but he's saying there's an old self and a new self. And a new self wants to do what's right. And he doesn't. And the new self doesn't want to do what's wrong, but he does because the old self wins out. How many of you can identify with that? So, I've concluded, I'll listen to Paul when he says, don't sin. Because he understands the struggle that we all have. Should we keep on sinning? No way, Paul says. So our problem today is, fine, let's don't sin. What's the question? How? How does that become a reality in our life? So here's the question we want to consider today. What do we do with sin? What do we do about sin in our lives? What do we do about that old self and the new self? who struggles. As we look at Romans 6, there are at least, I'm a preacher so you always think in threes, there are three things that I think Paul encourages us to do. Did I just lose my mic, Stan? Are we okay? All right? Okay. The first thing that we need to do when it comes to sin is we need to understand reality. Okay? We need to understand reality. This is the spiritual reality of justification and the believer in Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 6, Paul begins by painting a picture of baptism. He paints a picture of baptism. And that's good because what baptism is, is a picture of an inner spiritual reality of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So as you look at the first few verses in chapter 6, we need to understand reality. That if your faith is in Jesus Christ, Paul would say, this is true. Number one, you were baptized into Christ. You see, when a person, by the way, at Inspired Church, we practice what's called baptism by immersion. Okay, that's where we put you under the water. I'm glad that we do it that way because it paints a beautiful picture. Imagine, first of all, how many of you ever seen baptism by immersion? Most of you, okay. Um, I won't ask you who's been baptized by immersion, but uh, it's a good thing if you have been, by the way. Just picture it in your mind, baptism by immersion. Paul says we are baptized into Christ. Okay, so here's the person standing in the water and they're lowered into the water. So baptism is more than just getting wet. If you have proclaimed your faith in Jesus Christ, when you are baptized, you are being baptized into Jesus Christ. Secondly, Paul says, you are being baptized into His death. Jesus died. They crucified Him. He died for our sins. Paul says in the same way, when we are baptized, we are identified, we die with Jesus. Now, what dies with Jesus? Our old self. That goofy guy that was up on the screen. The old self dies in Christ. Thirdly, Paul says that our old life, the old self, is buried what did they do with Jesus after they crucified Him? They buried Him. Why did they bury Him? Thank you. He was dead. It's not deep, folks. Jesus died, so they buried Him. So here's the image. Here's the picture. As you're standing in the water of baptism and the pastor lowers you into the water, you are being what? Buried. You're being buried. Your old life, your sins are being buried with Jesus. That's reality according to Romans chapter 6. We're baptized into Christ, 
we are baptized into his death. Our old life is buried. Now, if you've ever been to a baptism, if you've ever been baptized, when Pastor Jim puts you under the water, what does he then do? Brings you up. I've been tempted a couple of times. <laughs> Paul says that like Jesus on Easter, what happened to Jesus? He rose from the grave. When you are placed under the water and identified with his death, identified with his burial, you are raised to new life. The old life, reality, is left in the grave. And a new life is given to us in Christ. Paul says that's the reality of justification. That's the reality of grace through faith. That's the reality of being saved. That's reality. So what that means is whenever we live in sin... We're living a lie. Whenever we live in sin, we're not living reality. We're living a lie. So Paul says in verses 11 through 13, he gives us the second thing we need to do. The first thing we need to do is understand reality. The reality is if we're justified, we've been, we died with Christ, buried with Christ, and we've been raised to a new life in Christ. The second thing that Paul tells us to do, it's in verses 11 through 13, we need to move away from sin. Move away from sin. Verses 11 uh, through 13, in the same way, count yourselves, consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. Paul tells us that in Christ we need to move away from sin. If this is sin, flee. Get away from it. Just ask you, what in your life is over here that you struggle with? Paul says that if you're in Christ, you need to, to, to move away from it. What behavior, what practice, what part of the old self still has a hold of you? Paul says, move away from it. Get away from it. My mind is wandering right now, which always scares me. <laughs> Years ago, one of my favorite shows on TV was really dumb. But it was the show Cheers. Remember Cheers? And what made no sense in that show was Sam owned the bar. And he watched Cheers. Do you remember that Sam was what? He was a playboy, that's funny. He was. <laughs> Sam was a recovering alcoholic. And I always said to myself, something's not right when the recovering alcoholic owns the bar and is in there every day. What would Paul say to Sam? Get out of there. But here's a problem. Moving away from sin is not the solution. There's a principle at work, and I think it's important for people to understand this principle. You can write it down. It's called the principle of filling the void. V-O-I-D. Filling the void. What happens in our lives is if we take something out, something needs to replace it. So if you've got sin in your life and you remove it, what's going to take its place? Because something will. That's a, that's a life principle. I wish more people understood this. When I was a pastor in Kent Square, Pennsylvania, it was our second church, God just opened the door for us to have this wonderful AA ministry in our church. Uh, 
the church doesn't do AA. What we did, though, was we opened up our facilities to an AA group. And oh my gosh, it exploded. Within about a year, we had AA in our church seven days a week. We had to kick them out on Sunday because it's like, people, we need our church. So six days a week, we had AA at lunchtime, and we had AA in the afternoons, and we had AA at night. And uh, we estimated that close to 500 people would come through our church every week for AA. It was fantastic. But you know what we found out about people in AA? They smoke like crazy. <laughs> they just smoke. And at first I was like, why do these people smoke? And then it hit me, it's the principle of the void. What have they done? They've taken, God has helped them take alcohol out of their life. And what if they put it in its place? Cigarettes. All right? That's just a principle of life. And I'm not saying every recovering person smokes cigarettes. If you're recovering today, praise God for you. But if you're recovering, you probably know how accurate this is. In Luke chapter, uh, it's Luke, 4, Luke 11, Jesus tells a story, he tells a parable about a man who's demon-possessed. And Jesus says this man has the demon driven out of him. So the man is set free from his possession. And Jesus says the, the demon goes out in the desert. Must have been Phoenix. So he's out in the desert and he's hanging out there. And when he comes back, he finds, it says, Jesus says the man's house is clean. But it's empty, Jesus says. There's a void there in that man's life. So when the demon comes back and he sees this void, Jesus says the demon brings, is it six or seven? He brings seven, yeah, he brings seven other demons with him and they inhabit the man. So Jesus says he's seven times worse than he was before he was set free. What happened? It was the principle of the void. So today, if you're struggling with sin in your life, and you say to yourself, tomorrow, I'm going to stop doing this. Your willpower might allow you to succeed for a while. But eventually, you will fail. If you take habitual sin out of your life and leave a void, there's no assurance of what's going to take its place. So Paul says, understand reality. Number two, he says, move away from sin. And number three is so important. Paul says, move towards God. Move towards God. Verse 13. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God. Offer yourself to God. So what you're going to do as you take out the sin, which creates a void, you're going to move closer to God who will fill <coughs> the void. Remember over the last couple of weeks as we looked at justification, one of the, the benefits, the so what to justification is God fills our hearts and our lives with what? His Holy Spirit. So as you begin to move away from sin and God pours His Holy Spirit into your life, His Spirit fills the void. If you simply try to stop sinning, you are going to fail every time. Because Paul says there's an old self that's living in you. It's fascinating. Paul says that the old self has been crucified with Jesus. So that means the old self is what? Yeah. Dead. But it hangs around. I couldn't help but think of a zombie. <laughs> Zombies are huge in our culture today. All the movies and the TV shows. What's a zombie? A zombie is somebody that's dead. And they don't come back to life. They're dead. 
And they just keep hanging around, causing trouble. And Paul says, that's our old self. The old self is dead, crucified in Jesus Christ. But the old self keeps hanging around. And somebody as great as the Apostle Paul struggled with this every day of his life. So what do we do? What do we do with sin in our life? We feed the young child. Feed the young child. Let's get there in just a second. I think we're thinking the same way, right? Don't get discouraged. Okay? That's the first thing I gotta tell you. Don't get discouraged. We can't tell our stories in a group like this because it would be too embarrassing. But I promise you today, you are surrounded by people who struggle with sin. I once had somebody tell me, again, I'm off track here, but we had somebody in our church years ago, and um, this person was struggling with sin. And a couple came into my office one night, and he said, Jim, you need to kick him out of the church because he's a sinner. Okay. Every now and then, God tells you the right thing to say in the moment. And I said, you know what? I agree completely. I said, I'll kick him out on one condition. If we kick him out, we kick all the sinners out. And then I told him, I've got a real problem with that. Because if we kick all the sinners out, I don't know who will be in the pews next week. And then I said, if we kick all the sinners out, I can't figure out who's going to preach. <laughs> Everybody struggles with sin because the old self is still there. So I want to encourage you not to be discouraged. I ran across this this past week and it really helped encourage me. A sinner fights to live up to God's Word. They struggle to live up to God's Word. A hypocrite fakes living up to God's Word. A hypocrite fakes it. But a believer grows into God's Word. See, my friends, following Jesus is a journey. It's a process. Fancy theological word for it is sanctification. And that's where God's Holy Spirit fills our life, fills our heart, and God makes the changes that need to be made. It may be I'm different than everybody else, but you know what I've discovered? God's not going to be finished with me until I meet Jesus face to face. I praise God. I've known Jesus for 50 years now. And I praise God I am not the person I used to be. And I'll tell you, I'm doing better in following Jesus. And I'm so thankful for that. But the old self still exists. And I still struggle. So let's go back to Paul and his struggle in Romans 7. The whole, I don't do what I should do and I do what I shouldn't do thing. In verse 21, Paul continues on. And Paul says, I find this law at work. I find this principle at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. Paul says, I love doing the right thing. It feels so good to follow Jesus. But, verse 23, I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. And Paul says, what a wretched man I am. 
Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Verse 25. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, the only possible solution to sin in our lives is Jesus. Amen. That's it. Move closer to Jesus.